So hello everyone, welcome to episode uh, 31 of Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. Uh, my name is Pavel Gora. I'm founder and CEO of the Quantum AI Foundation, uh, which is uh, an official organizer uh, of these meetups. Uh, I'm also a board member of uh, QWORT and coordinator of its uh, QCAS in QPoland. Uh, so in the second part, uh, or in the later part of my lecture, uh, I will tell you a bit more about the Quantum AI Foundation, QWORT and QPoland, and in general about uh, the quantum computing ecosystem that uh, we are building in Poland and uh, also worldwide. Uh, but uh, uh, I will start uh, from an introduction to quantum computing. So I will give you a bit of theory about quantum computing. Uh, later, uh, I will tell you about some possible uh, expected, at least expected applications of quantum computing. Uh, and uh, uh, in the final part, uh, as I said, uh, I will also introduce the quantum computing ecosystem that we are currently building in Poland and worldwide. And hopefully, if we have some time at the end, there will be also a Q&A session. All right, so uh, we can start. Uh, so what exactly is uh, quantum computing? So the simple answer is these are computations according to the laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, the full answer is, of course, uh, more uh, complex, more complicated, but we also try to explain it in details. Uh, so uh, what does quantum actually mean? Uh, in physics, a quantum uh, is the minimum amount of any physical entity or physical property involved in an interaction. And the fundamental notion that a physical property can be quantized is referred to as the hypothesis of quantization. And this means that the magnitude of the physical property can take only discrete values consisting of integer multiples of one quantum. And uh, everything started from the Max Planck's postulate, uh, which basically says that the electromagnetic energy could be emitted only in quantized form, right? So the energy, um, the energy is uh, proportional to the <clears throat> frequency of a photon or electromagnetic wave. There is a Planck's constant involved as well, and uh, there is an integer which is which gives this uh, proportion, right? Uh, so um, it may look simple, but uh, it turned out that uh, it have very interesting and important consequences. So at the end of the 19th century, some physicists uh, thought that uh, the physics is almost uh, completed and there are still just some um, minor open problems that should be explained, but it turned out that explaining this uh, open challenges led to um, just the birth of totally new uh, domain of physics, which is quantum mechanics, and later to quantum computing as well. Uh, because uh, computation is a physical process, right? So we can think about, when we think about computations, we can think about algorithms. We can uh, try to mathematically prove the correctness of the algorithms or, um, uh, or to assess uh, time complexity of a given algorithm. But eventually uh, we would like to implement our algorithms and then run the programs on physical uh, devices, right? So computation is a physical process. So it's governed by the rules of uh, physical world, which is inherently quantum. And uh, we know it from uh, more than 100 years. So it may have very interesting consequences. So I guess that at least some of you have also heard about something that is called the Landauer principle, which basically says that there is a minimum possible amount of energy required to any logically irreversible manipulation of information, like erase uh, one bit of information. And uh, this minimum amount of energy uh, is uh, proportional to the temperature of the environment. And this time there is a Boltzmann's constant involved. Right, so uh, we know that we cannot uh, execute, we cannot perform our computations uh, for free, right? So there's a minimum uh, amount of energy that is that is required for some computations at least. Uh, all right, what are some other uh, consequences? Uh, can we build our uh, computers 
much or can we do our computers much smaller than they are now? So uh, Richard Feynman, a very famous physicist, said in uh, about 1960 that there is nothing that I can see in the physical laws that says the computer elements cannot be made enormously smaller than they are now. And in fact, there may be certain advantages. Uh, so it was uh, more than 60 years ago. At, at that time, um, the computer, computing devices, computers were much, uh, much larger than nowadays. Uh, and uh, it was not uh, clear if, uh, or, or if, if there are some physical um, boundaries, right, for, uh, for, for these computational devices. Uh, and uh, but uh, scientists were able to observe a progress, right? And uh, this progress was formulated by Gordon Moore's law, which says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles about every two years. And this prediction proved accurate for several decades and has been used in the semiconductor industry to guide long-term planning and to set targets for uh, research and development. But in 2015, Gordon Moore himself said that uh, uh, he sees more slow dying here in the next decade or so. Uh, and uh, Intel, a company working on uh, processors, also realized in 2015 that the pace of advancement has slowed uh, from two years to two and a half years. Uh, and um, so in fact, at the beginning, uh, about 60 years ago, uh, it was uh, even doubling not once per two years, but even once per one and a half year, more or less. But we expect that this trend will continue for some, for some time at least, but can it, can it go on forever? So if we assume that this law will be continued for more years, then about 2035 or 2040, the size of a single transistor should be of a size of a single atom. And in such a scale, uh, we have the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, so computations uh, should be probably done in a totally different way. And in fact, even much earlier, uh, we can expect uh, difficulties in just making our transistors uh, much, much smaller. In fact, even already, it's a, it's a challenge for companies working on uh, processors to just um, uh, accelerating um, the speed of computations or making the integrated circuits uh, even more dense. So it's already a challenge. Uh, okay, so, uh, but, but anyway, can we, uh, can we reach such a scale? Can we reach a scale in which uh, just a single atom may uh, serve as a transistor? Uh, the same uh, physicist, Richard Feynman, in 1983 said that now we can, in principle, make a computing device in which the numbers are represented by a row of atoms with each atom in either of the two states. That's our input. The Hamiltonian starts Hamiltonianizing the wave function. The ones move around, the zeros move around, and finally, along a particular bunch of atoms, ones and zeros occur that represent the answer. Nothing could be made smaller, nothing could be more elegant. No losses, no uncertainties, no averaging. But can we do it? That's the question. Uh, so since uh, now we have a lecture titled Introduction to Quantum Computing, then uh, probably you can expect, and I guess that you already know that there are already some uh, quantum processors uh, developed. So here you can see the Bristol-Con, which is one of the Google's quantum processors. Um, and on the right is a carton of, uh, of this device with, where each uh, X represents a qubit with nearest neighbor connectivity. So th this is just example because currently uh, there are many other companies working on uh, quantum processors. So I will tell about it later uh, in the second part of, of my lecture. Okay, so we know that uh, we can already uh, build some quantum computers. So later I will tell you what's the current status and uh, whether we can already perform some useful computations on such computers, but uh, what, exactly the quantum computer is and what's the difference between quantum computer and a classical computer. So in case of classical computers, as you probably know, we have bits and classical gates, so the classical gates like uh, and, or, not, 
Uh, but in case of quantum computers, we have qubits and quantum gates. So what's the difference? So in case of classical computers, um, a bit may have a state which uh, is an element from the set zero one. So it, from, mat from mathematical perspective, it's something relatively simple. But uh, in case of qubits, in case of quantum computers, uh, state of a qubit may be in a superposition of states zero and one. And what is this superposition? So mathematically, it can be a unitary vector of the two-dimensional Hilbert space over complex numbers. So it's already um, sounds complicated and difficult, for sure much more complex than in case of a bit, right? Because we have, we have some vectors, we have a two-dimensional Hilbert space over complex numbers. So sounds complicated, but uh, soon I will tell you how we can think about, uh, um, about qubits and states of qubits. And there are some other differences. So in case of classical computers, state is determined. So we can know exactly whether the state of a bit is zero or one, and uh, the state can be changed from zero to one and, and vice versa. Uh, you, for example, uh, we can use uh, classical gates to, to change uh, the states uh, of bits. But in case of quantum computers, we have the superposition. And uh, so to get values zero or one, we should do a measurement which breaks the superposition. So when a qubit in a, is, is in a superposition of states zero and one, um, there is just a probability of getting zero or one uh, after the measurement. And this probability uh, depends uh, on the state of a qubit, which is a unitary vector of this two-dimensional Hilbert space. And our quantum gates may modify qubits and modify its probability. Of, of getting zero or one um, after the measurement. Okay, so uh, how can we think about uh, superposition? So uh, we have these pure states uh, zero and one, uh, which can be considered as an orthonormal base of a quantum system. So uh, that's why uh, we have um, two dimensional space, in fact. So uh, zero and one, uh, can be represented as an orthonormal base as two vectors being base uh, of a quantum system and A and B are complex numbers. Uh, but uh, it cannot be arbitrary complex numbers because uh, the state of a qubit should be a unitary vector uh, in this two dimensional space. So the squares of the amplitudes of these complex numbers should sum up to one, right? Um, so and, and uh, the square or squares of the of these amplitudes are just probabilities of getting zero or one in a measurement. So that's why sum should be equal to one. All right. Uh, so what we can do with um, such a representation? Um, if if we multiply. Um, and if we multiply our quantum state by a unitary vector, uh, in fact, we doesn't change uh, the quantum state. We, do we doesn't change the probability of getting zero and one. Uh, and uh, for each complex number, there is or there are there is uh, another complex number, uh, such that when we multiply this complex number by that complex complex number, we get uh, a real value. So it's not uh, only complex number, but it's uh, it's a real value. Uh, so we can also represent uh, each uh, quantum state in such a form that here we have uh, a real number, uh, which should be from um, uh, the interval from a range from minus one to one, because uh, anyway, our sum of, of the amplitude should be equal to one, right? So it cannot be greater than one. And if it's from the range minus one to one, then it's uh, cosinus of uh, some angle, right? Uh, and uh, at the same time, we can uh, also uh, represent uh, the second complex number in such a form. And this, this is just a requirement uh, for the sum of the amplitudes equal to one. So instead of having two complex numbers, we can also think about having two uh, angles, in fact. And uh, there is therefore there is a correspondence between states 
or quantum states and uh, points on a sphere that is on a sphere that is called the block sphere. Right, so when we have uh, points on the block sphere, uh, then uh, each such point can be just determined by two angles, which determine uh, the, our quantum state. So in classical computers, our bits uh, can be zero or one, or the state of a bit can be zero and one or one. And uh, these are just uh, uh, un antiporic points on a block sphere. But in case of quantum computers, the qubit state can be any point on the block sphere, actually, right? And when we apply some quantum gates, uh, we can just uh, mm, we can just do some uh, operations on this sphere, and uh, some points on the sphere can can just can be just transferred to to some other points. So we'll see soon how to do it. Um, there are some questions on our chat. Uh, there's a question about recording. Yes, there will, this event is recorded, so there will be video uploaded to, uh, to our YouTube channel. All right, so uh, that's why we also sometimes say that uh, quantum computing is a journey on the block sphere. Um, because some, when we apply quantum gates, then po some points or points on our block sphere are transformed to some other points. Uh, so, what are uh, possible transformations? Um, so, uh, these are some notable examples of quantum uh, gates that can transform our uh, uh, our block sphere. Uh, and uh, since we operate uh, in two-dimensional Hilbert space, it's sufficient to uh, just. Uh, um, to just determine or specify how our uh, base vectors, our uh, ortho vectors uh, that are our orthonormal base of so zero or one are transformed. So for example, in case of the Hadamard's gate, uh, zero and one are transformed to a combination of pure state zero and one, uh, such that the probability of uh, obtaining zero on, or one um, after the measurement is the same, so it's equal to just one half. Uh, there's another gate, is Pauli X gate. Uh, so uh, it's a quantum um, uh, quantum correspondence to uh, classical knot gate, right? Because the state pure state zero is transformed to pure state one, and state one is transformed to zero. Similarly, there are uh, Pauli Y and Z gates. And I will later explain why we call them X, Y, and Z. Uh, so these are example of, examples of gates uh, operating on just a single qubit. But of course, there might be uh, quantum gates operating on more qubits. So for example, uh, there is a synod gate which uh, operates on two qubits. And one qubit is a controller for, for not operation or this X Pauli gate operation on the second qubit. Uh, okay, and uh, how we can also think about uh, such computations and, and transformations. So, uh, as I said, the vectors uh, zero and one are um, orthonorm orthonormal base of a two dimensional Hilbert space. So, we can also think about these vectors as vectors one, zero, or zero, one. Uh, and uh, if in such a representation, we also have uh, um, a unitary matrix uh, operating on uh, our vectors, right? So uh, for each quantum gate, we, we should also have a unitary matrix operating uh, on, um, on our qubits. So for example, in case of Hadamard's gate, this is a Hadamard's matrix, right? So you can check that if we uh, apply the pure state zero, so vector one zero, then indeed we get a combination or superposition of state zero and one, such that with the same probability we, we get a zero or one after the measurement. And it's, it's the same or it's similar, it's similar for uh, the pure state one, right? Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, we can think about the Hadamard's gate as a rotation of P about the axis X plus Z 
or alternatively, it's a rotation by P over two around Y axis and then P around Z. Uh, so here we mean rotations uh, on our blocks here, right? So we had this three axis X, Y, Z, and uh, we can just uh, do some rotations and we can easily check that uh, spe some specific rotations correspond to uh, to the op intended operations, right? And uh, we can also check it by uh, applying um, the given matrix. And it's the same for, for other gates. So for example, in case of X Pauli gate, uh, we have a rotation of P about the axis uh, X. And similarly for a Pauli Y and Pauli Z gate, uh, we'll have rotations of P about uh, the axis uh, Y and Z. Uh, so here is a Pauli X matrix. And uh, here is a matrix for C naught gate. So as I said, here we have, this time we operate on two uh, qubits. Uh, so if we have two qubits, uh, then uh, we are in four dimensional space. So, and in general, if we uh, have a quantum system composed of N qubits, then in fact, we are in two to the power of n dimensional uh, space. Uh, so if we have this four dimensional space, then we can also uh, identify our, um, uh, our um, vectors, our orthonormal base uh, as uh, such base vectors, and uh, then define, uh, so the, the, then the, the uh, corresponding matrix defines um, our operation, right? So here in the case of C0 gate, uh, we have um, operation on two qubits and we perform the not operation on the second qubit only when the first qubit is one and otherwise the second uh, qubit uh, is left unchanged. Uh, okay, so, so far we've been talking mostly about uh, just a single qubit or at most two qubits, but the true power of quantum computing uh, comes from quantum parallelism and uh, uh, working on uh, many qubits at the same time. So if we have n qubits, uh, then uh, we can prepare a superposition of two to the power of n numbers. Uh, so in case of n classical bits, we can represent just a single n bit number at the same time on n, n bits. But in case of n qubits, potentially we can represent all two to the power of n uh, and bit numbers with some specific probabilities, of course, right? Um, and, and then when we apply a given quantum system, so a system composed of some quantum gates, then in fact, we apply it to all these uh, possible states at the same time. And now the whole idea of uh, quantum computations in such a gate-based uh, approach is to uh, build quantum circuits um, doing the computations that, that we want. So at, at the end, in most of the cases, we would like to get some specific results with, uh, with a specific probability, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and how to, how to do it, of course, uh, may of course depend on a specific task. So I will later also tell you about, um, about some possible applications. Uh, and uh, about also a bit different approach for quantum computing that is called quantum uh, annealing or adiabatic quantum computing, because it's a, it's a bit different paradigm for, for quantum computations. Uh, but uh, let's see an example of a quantum circuit. Uh, it's still relatively simple, but uh, I will show you uh, what we can potentially do and uh, how we can perform some computations. So here in this quantum circuit, we have eight qubits numbered from zero to seven. Uh, and uh, in case of three qubits, Q3, Q5, Q7, we don't have any uh, quantum gate. So the initial state of each qubit was zero. So at the end, when we do a measurement, uh, the, the measured state will be zero. So in case of qubits number three, five, and seven, uh, the measured value will be zero. Uh, however, in case of qubit number six, we have not gate. 
so this x x Pauli gate, in fact. Uh, so since at the beginning the qubit, the state of the qubit was zero, then after application of this x Pauli gate and after doing measurement, uh, the result will be uh, one with probability one, of course. Uh, things uh, become more interesting for qubits zero, one, two, and four, because uh, in case of qubit four, we have the Hadamard's gate. So uh, as you remember, initially we had uh, the pure state zero here in case of qubit number four. So after applying Hadamard's gate, um, we have uh, the state that is a superposition of state zero and one, right? So we have the superposition of state zero and one. And uh, potentially, so if we do a measurement here, then we'll get zero or one with the same probability. But we do a measurement later. And uh, what is happening here? So here we have three synod gates. Uh, so these synod gates uh, make our uh, some of our qubits entangled. And uh, so for example, uh, this is synod gate. And if the value of, uh, um, uh, of, a, of this qubit four uh, will be zero here, then the state uh, of the qubit two will be uh, still zero and after the measurement we'll get zero. But since we have x polygate here, then after the measurement here, we'll receive a value one. And it's similar for qubit zero, uh, zero and one as well. So if uh, we measure one here for a qubit four, then uh, we'll always get zeros for qubits zero, one, and two. And uh, again, if uh, we had value one here, then the state of qubits zero, one, and two will be changed to one. But here we apply uh, the x gate again. Uh, so uh, here we'll get value zero if, uh, after the measurement. But uh, at the same time, we'll measure values one for qubits zero, one, and two. But the values zero and one for a qubit four uh, are received with uh, the same probability, with probability one half, right? With 0 0.5. So with the probability one half, we'll get values um, zero, one, zero, uh, zero, zero, one, one, one. And with the same probability, we'll get uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, so these are uh, these two possible outcomes uh, of the measurements are just uh, uh, two 8 bit representations, uh, uh, which uh, in the ASCII code correspond to letters P and G, which are my initials in this case. So you can easily uh, design a similar circuit. So this quantum circuit was designed uh, using um, a framework that is called IBM uh, Quantum Experience. So you can uh, go to the IBM Q website and try to do something similar uh, for your uh, name, for your initials as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, in case of eight, uh, eight bits, we'll be able to just uh, represent just a single 8-bit number at a given time. But here, we're able to represent and get to 8-bit uh, numbers. So it is relatively simple, right? But it was just to uh, give you an example on how we can design quantum circuits and what we can um, expect, what might be the outcomes, right? Uh, uh, I will tell you soon about some, some other more advanced applications, of course. Uh, so why it's, why it's important? So I already said that in case of classical computers, on n bits, we can process only one n bit number at the same time. While in case of quantum computers, using n qubits, we can process all two to the power of n n bit numbers at the same time. And potentially, it may have some advantages uh, comparing to classical computers. Uh, we'll later see if there are such advantages in it. Uh, what are the other differences? So in case of classical computers, results are deterministic, in fact. So randomness is usually a pseudo-randomness. So we just have um, generators of um, 
random numbers. But in case of quantum computers, we may have uh, real randomness and uh, we can easily sample from probability distributions, which are difficult, that are difficult for classical computers. And uh, this may have some interesting applications. So what are possible applications of quantum computers? This is the second part of this lecture. Um, one of the expected applications uh, is quantum cryptography or breaking some classical cryptography algorithms, but also designing um, some new uh, methods for quantum cryptography, quantum communication, um, solving combinatorial optimization problems, uh, which frequently occur in many disciplines like uh, artificial intelligence, finance, transport, logistics. So when you, if you are interested in machine learning, for example, then in machine learning, uh, or machine learning is almost uh, all about uh, optimization. Um, usually it's uh, not combinatorial or discrete optimization. Um, it's, it can be also continuous optimization, but when, we, when you solve optimization problems uh, using computers, then you always represent your numbers in a discrete form, right? Uh, so anyway, almost everything can be considered as a combinatorial optimization problem. Uh, something from difficult distributions like uh, Boltzmann distributions. And it's also expected that we have some applications in, in machine learning. Uh, simulating quantum processes, right? This may help in discovering new materials, new drugs. So currently <clears throat> scientists uh, very often have to just simulate some very complex processes on a quantum scale. Um, and uh, they have to apply employees, large supercomputers, um, which is uh, currently still st state of the art, but uh, it seems that um, when we want to simulate some processes, quantum processors, processes in, in a small scale, then uh, probably quantum computers may give some advantage. So at least this is something that we that we also expect. All right. Um, so uh, this is just one of the examples solving solving combinatorial optimization problems. So in combinatorial optimization problems, we search for the best of many possible combinations. Uh, so this family of problems include scheduling challenges like uh, should I ship this package on this track or the next one. Or what's the most efficient route a traveling salesperson should take to visit different cities, right? And it turns out physics can help solve these sorts of problems because we can frame them as energy minimization problems. And a fundamental rule of physics is that everything tends to seek a minimum energy state. So for example, objects slide down hills, hot things cool down over time. And this behavior is also true in the world of quantum physics. And uh, there is an idea for um, quantum computation that is called quantum annealing, which simply uses quantum physics to find low energy states uh, of a problem and therefore the optimal or near optimal combination of elements. So uh, the whole idea is that we should translate our optimization problem uh, into a, some kind of a quantum system uh, such that um, the state uh, of the lowest energy of this quantum system will correspond to the optimum, so preferably global optimum of our optimization problem. And soon I will uh, show you how to do it. Um, okay, so this is related to something that is called uh, an adiabatic process. So what is an adiabatic process? Adiabatic process is a process that does not involve the transfer of heat or matter into or out of a thermodynamic system. So in an adiabatic process, energy is transferred to the surroundings only as work. And uh, there is an idea for something that's called adiabatic quantum computer. So first, a potentially complicated Hamiltonian is found whose ground state describes the solution to the problem of interest. Uh, so uh, I think that I haven't uh, told you yet what the Hamiltonian is. So you can, you can think about a Hamiltonian as a function um, returning the, the energy uh, of a given um, quantum state uh, for, for, for our quantum system, right? So our quantum system may be in different quantum states and for each quantum state, Hamiltonian corresponds to the energy of, uh, of the system in a given state. So uh, 
yeah, so first we should uh, find a Hamiltonian whose ground state, so uh, whose minimum, global, op global minimum describes the solution to the problem of interest. So, to, for, so for example, to, it should describe uh, the global optimum of our uh, optimization problem. And then a system with a simple Hamiltonian is prepared. So for example, it can be just uh, the basic quantum system after applying the Hadamard's uh, gate to all uh, qubits. And such a simple Hamiltonian, such a simple system is prepared and initialized to the ground state. And finally, the simple Hamiltonian is adiabatically evolved to the desired compli complicated Hamiltonian. So adiabatically evolved means that according to the adiabatic process, so without transfer of heat or matter into or out of the thermodynamic system. So at the end, the state of the system describes the solution to the problem. So the idea is that if we have adiabatic uh, computations, there is something that is called the adiabatic theorem, which says that uh, if we evolve our system adiabatically, then uh, we will stay, or the system will stay uh, in the ground uh, state, right? So when we are able to prepare, uh, so after preparation of our quantum system um, in such a way that uh, the system was in the ground state, when we evolve uh, the system uh, in such a way that we modify our Hamiltonian toward this complicated Hamiltonian corresponding to our optimization problem, then if we do it in an adiabatic way, then uh, we should stay uh, in the ground state. So at the end, uh, we'll be able to get uh, the global minimum, right, of, uh, of our optimization problem. So at least that's the idea and that's the hope. Uh, but in practice, uh, it's uh, complicated because it's, first of all, it's very difficult to, uh, to have the process that is really adiabatic. So it's almost impossible. Um, so this is one thing. Another thing is that uh, we should also perform such, uh, um, such evaluations, such modification of our quantum system uh, in a proper way. So we, we should do it uh, slow enough, let's say. And uh, it also means that uh, it's possible that we'll not get any advantage comparing to classical computations. So this is one thing. And another thing is that it's also easy to um, break this adiabatic rule and uh, uh, receive uh, at the end a result that will not be the global optimum, right? So it can be, let's say, heuristically optimal solutions or suboptimal sub solution, which can be still good enough, but uh, it doesn't have to be a global optimum, right? So it, it still, it doesn't mean that uh, for sure we'll be able to solve some, let's say, anti-hard problems, for example. Uh, but what is interesting is that adiabatic quantum computing has been shown to be polynomially equivalent to this conventional quantum computing in the circuit model. Uh, in the circuit model, so in this model with quantum gates that I've already described. All right, but uh, how to perform some such uh, adiabatic computations? Uh, so everything is uh, mm, based on something that is called Ising model. So the Ising model is a model of ferromagnetism, which is uh, traditionally used in statistical mechanics. So our, so we have some binary variables. Uh, they may have two possible values, minus one or plus one, and they correspond to spin up or spin down uh, in our uh, uh, ferromagnetic system. Uh, so this can be just uh, atomic spins or magnetic dipole moments. Uh, and uh, relationships between the spins represented by couplings are correlations or anti-correlations. And uh, the objective function, so Hamiltonian, is expressed as an Ising model. So here we have this, this Ising model. So this is this Hamiltonian. This is uh, the function describing the energy of uh, this, our quantum system depending on uh, values of the spins, right? So uh, values of this S, I, S, J variables can be plus one or minus one. Uh, and uh, we have this linear coefficients corresponding to cu qubit biases. These are uh, H, I, and the quadratic coefficients corresponding to coupling strengths. Um, all right, so... Um, 
also we have something in mathematics, we have something that is called quadrating unconstrained binary optimization, uh, which is just uh, some kind of a, an optimization problem. Uh, so again, we have binary variables, which can be true or false. So this time the states correspond to values one and zero. Uh, and uh, again, we have some parameters. We have some coefficients here, right? Um, and uh, our goal in this optimization uh, problem is to find such an assignment of uh, for these binary variables, xi, xj, uh, that would uh, minimize the value of uh, our uh, objective function, right? So uh, in order to just define uh, this Hamiltonian on the, the cubo formulation, we need the parameters Q. So uh, we need an upper diagonal uh, matrix. And so yeah, there is also a matrix representation here of, of this cubo formulation. Uh, and uh, yeah, so basically that's, that's the idea. Uh, and uh, now, the, the whole idea between quantum annealing is that when we have our optimization problem, we should find this cubo formulation, cubo representation of our optimization problem. And uh, soon I will just present an example showing how to do it. And then it can be, thanks to the correspondence between cubo and the Ising model, uh, these representations could, could, can be uh, just uh, transferred to the physical a quantum system, and then we can just perform the computations uh, um, that, that were described here, right? Uh, but uh, uh, yes, yeah, so initially we should have a um, Hamiltonian that is relatively easy to prepare, uh, for which also the ground state is easy to prepare. So this can be just a um, application of a or su superposition of all possible two to the power of n um, n bit uh, numbers uh, after application of the Hadamard's gate. And uh, here we should also have the Hamiltonian corresponding to our Ising model, right? And here you can see that we have a parameter s. And this parameter s uh, is uh, it just can, can be changed by modifying a strength of the magnetic field, right? And according to this adiabatic theorem that I've already told you about, if we change uh, S, the value of S slow enough, the finite state will be the solution of, of our problem, should be our global optimum. But as I already also said, in practice, it's uh, difficult to achieve. Um, so instead of just expecting that at the end we'll get the global optimum, we should rather expect that uh, we'll get a suboptimal suboptim suboptim solution, which can be still good enough, right? So in case of many optimization problems that we want to solve using classical computers, very often we also apply some heuristics, meta heuristics or approximation, uh, approximation algorithms. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the idea basically. Uh, all right. And, uh, um, one of the important quantum phenomena um, helping us achieving such good uh, solutions or finding good solutions is called quantum tunneling. So as I said, by controlling the strength of a magnetic field, that's not enough, we can change the landscape. So we start from the ground state of a quantum system that is easy to prepare. And thanks to quantum tunneling, we end up in a minimum of a quantum state corresponding to our problem. Right, so thanks to this quantum tunneling process, when we modify the landscape of our Hamiltonian by modifying the strength of a magnetic field, we can also, in theory at least, uh, we can uh, ensure that our uh, quantum system will uh, can go from uh, one quantum state to another quantum state for which the Hamiltonian will have a lower value. Uh, and there is a link to the nice explanation uh, prepared by D-Wave. D-Wave is a, a company from Canada um, developing such uh, quantum annealing machines. And there might be some interesting applications of this approach. So it's not science fiction anymore because even a few years ago, uh, Volkswagen together with uh, D-Wave um, conducted interesting experiments in order to optimize 
routes of a fleet of taxis in Beijing. Uh, and um, this research was uh, published and described in a paper, Traffic Flow Optimization Using a Quantum Annealer. Uh, you can just uh, open a link if you are interested and, and uh, read it. Uh, it's relatively short. Uh, so first they built a road network and uh, they had some routes from real GPS data. Uh, so uh, this was the data set called T-Drive. Uh, it's data set of uh, uh, routes for routes of taxis in Beijing. Uh, these were routes from the city center to, uh, to the airport in Beijing. Uh, and for each car, for each taxi, uh, the scientists added two possible routes between source and destination. Right, so beside the original routes, there were just two other options for each car. So uh, each car had in total three possible options. And it was also assumed that cars may share road segments. It was also assumed that uh, the travel time is proportional to the function, uh, in fact, to the square of a number of cars on a route. So it's a simplification, but thanks to such a simplification, um, they were able to just uh, construct and design a very nice and elegant uh, cubo formulation. And now the goal was to minimize the total uh, travel time. Uh, all right, so uh, how can we do it? So let's introduce some binary variables. So the variable Q i j uh, indicates whether car i take, uh, takes root uh, j. Uh, so it can be zero or one, right? And uh, we know that each car should take exactly one root. So that's why uh, we need to introduce such a condition, right? So this is our, this is our constraint. When we uh, sum these variables for each car, uh, this sum should be equal to one. Okay, so this is our constraint. And of course, it should be true for, for all uh, cars, for all vehicles. Uh, also, let, let's assume that BS is a set of these binary variables that are associated with roots that share Street, se street segment S. And now, according to the assumption that we did here, so that the travel time is proportional to the square of a number of cars on the route, uh, we have uh, uh, the function describing our cost or cost for, uh, for a route uh, or for a road segment S, right? So the cost for a road segment S uh, is just uh, the sum of all um, all cars uh, passing given road segment uh, to the power of two, right? Uh, and now when we just calculate the aggregated cost for all uh, for all the road segments in our road network graph, then we have the total cost that we would like to minimize. So that's our objective function. But at the same time, so if we only focus on uh, minimizing uh, this cost function, then we can easily see that uh, the solution is uh, just assigning uh, value zero to all our binary variables, right? But at the same time, we want this condition to be fulfilled, right, for each vehicle. So that's why we have to add a constraint. So we add a constraint. Uh, and if this constraint is uh, uh, satisfied. So if the sum is zero, then we have only the cost, and this is what we want to uh, to minimize. But uh, if it's not satisfied, then this value should be uh, so large that uh, it cannot be considered uh, as a solution for our optimization problem. So the value of a parameter lambda should be set uh, uh, to, should be uh, set in such a way that if even if uh, the value of this sum is equal to one, then it cannot be uh, an optimal solution for our optimization problem. So this value should be relatively high. Okay, but when we set this value, 
we can easily see that it is a cubo formulation, right? Because we have some binary variables and all these binary variables are in the power uh, at most two. Uh, so uh, it's a good cubo formulation that can be solved uh, using quantum annealing by just uh, translating our cubo formulation to the Ising model and to our quantum annealing machine, right? And uh, therefore it can be solved using quantum annealing on the wave's machine. And in this case, the scientists uh, conducted experiments on the wave 2x uh, quantum processing unit. Uh, so um, they uh, conduct experiments for 418 taxis, 418 cars. So in total, they had uh, three times more uh, logical variables, because as you remember, for each car, uh, we have uh, three binary variables. So in total, we have very large space of possible solutions. And in such a space, we would like to find uh, the optimal solution, or at least a solution that will be, let's say, good enough. So for example, better than uh, the, the original uh, solution, so the, the reward traffic. So as a result, they achieved a relatively small number of streets uh, that were heavily occupied. So these are the, the results. So the color indicates the density of cars or the number of cars uh, traveling through a given road segment. Uh, so uh, yeah, and uh, they were able to achieve it in only 22 seconds. So uh, most likely it will be possible to obtain similarly good solutions using classical algorithms, like some heuristics, meta heuristics uh, that can be run on classical computers, right? So we cannot say that uh, it's something that we cannot compute on classical computers. Uh, most likely we can, we can do it. So it, unfortunately it uh, was not checked or at least it was not uh, described in the original paper, but I, I guess that we should, we should expect at least that uh, this can be also solved uh, on the classical computer as well. But at least uh, it just shows that we can already perform some computations uh, on a quantum computer, right? And get some interesting and meaningful results, uh, which is quite optimistic. Uh, and uh, potentially similar, similar approaches can be uh, applied to solve many other optimization problems, uh, which for example, frequently occur in logistics like traveling salesman problem and similar anti-hard problems, like vehicle routing problem, pickup and delivery problem. And there are already logistic companies interested in such solutions. So this is interesting. And also I've already mentioned that uh, machine learning or contemporary machine learning is almost all about optimization. And even if we train our neural networks, our goal is to find weights of connections between neurons as uh, such that will uh, minimize um, the given loss function, right? So it's just it's just uh, a, an optimization problem. Uh, currently, when we train neural networks, we solve it using a backpropagation algorithm, uh, thanks to the gradient descent approach. But uh, there are also already approaches to solve it uh, using some alternative. Uh, methods and maybe in the future quantum computing can be uh, can be used uh, for such applications as well. And uh, in fact, I've already um, found and heard heard about uh, quantum um, uh, quantum approaches to most of the popular existing uh, machine learning algorithms like generative adversarial networks or reinforcement learning or support vector machines, right? So there are already such approaches. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, can we expect that we'll be able to solve some even more meaningful problems uh, in the future? So I guess that you've already heard about uh, the quantum supremacy experiment uh, carried out by Google uh, about two years ago. And in, indeed, we can observe that there is a progress. So uh, at least from 2017, in 2017, D-Wave uh, announced uh, a special purpose quantum annealing processor with more than 2000 qubits. IBM announced a quantum uh, computer with 50 qubits. 
uh, Google announced uh, quantum computer with more than 70 qubits. Uh, also, uh, currently, I uh, recently I heard that uh, um, quantum processor uh, from China, USTC, is considered as the most powerful because uh, beside uh, the number of qubits, what is important is also fidelity of uh, uh, of uh, our of the gates and uh, uh, low noise, and uh, in case of this uh, uh, Chinese quantum quantum computer, uh, it was on a quite a good level. Similarly, as in case of IonQ's uh, quantum computer, which which uh, has thirty two qubits, but with uh, relatively low gate errors, which is which is very positive. Uh, and in fact, there are several approaches to build quantum computers. I will also tell later about it. Uh, so for example, we can build superconducting quantum processors or uh, quantum processors based on ion, ion traps. Uh, and uh, I think that these two approaches uh, currently dominate uh, the industry of uh, quantum processors. But beside the hardware, we can also observe that there are more and more uh, frameworks, software development kits for just developing quantum computers. So here are just examples of some SDKs with access to quantum processors. Uh, Project Hue, Qiskit, Forest from, from Ugeti, Strawberry Fields, and Pendelein. So Pendelein was considered as a TensorFlow of quantum computing before uh, Google released uh, TensorFlow Quantum as well. Uh, there are also SDKs based on simulators like uh, Microsoft Quantum Development Kit. So Microsoft even um, developed uh, its own quantum programming language that is called QSharp. Uh, and what might be the future? Because we can see that there is a progress, we can observe the progress, but what might be the future? So there is a quotation uh, attributed to Abraham Lincoln, but also a few other people uh, more contemporary, that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Uh, so this is also one of the reasons why uh, it's important to build and contribute to building this quantum computing in ecosystem. Uh, and uh, what are the obstacles on the road to our quantum supremacy, right? Uh, so the coherence. So it's difficult to isolate qubits from the environment. And if the qubits are not isolated, then there might be coherence, which just breaks superposition. Um, so uh, this is one of the challenges. Error correction. So uh, similarly, as in case of classical bits and classical computers, uh, there might be some errors in our computations. Uh, during the measurement or uh, by applying quantum gates. So we also need some uh, quantum error correction codes. Um, algorithms. So we already know some quantum uh, computing algorithms, but it's difficult to, to prove that quantum algorithms will be better than classical algorithms. Uh, so uh, there is, a, for example, there is a famous Shor's algorithm uh, for um, factorizing uh, numbers, uh, and uh, we can prove that this uh, quantum algorithm, or in fact hybrid algorithm, because uh, there is classical part and, and the quantum part, we can prove that this, this algorithm uh, uh, has a polynomial time complexity, but uh, it hasn't been proven yet that uh, um, this factorization problem cannot be um, solve in polynomial time on uh, classical computers, or at least um, there was no such a publication yet, right? Uh, it's generally uh, believed that the factorization problem is difficult, and based on, based on that assumption, uh, some uh, cryptographic protocols are, are based, but uh, formally it, it hasn't been proved yet. Uh, there is also another example that I will elaborate later, which is a recommendation problem. So it's quite a similar case. Um, yeah, building some quantum gates is it's still challenging, right? So again, how to build quantum gates, uh, especially uh, for, uh, for example, photonic quantum computers. Um, yeah, so we can see that there are some obstacles. So most likely we cannot or we shouldn't expect the powerful uh, quantum computers uh, available and released uh, in the nearest future. 
So we should probably rather uh, assume that uh, uh, our computation should be performed uh, on uh, noisy quantum processors. Uh, so um, this approach is called uh, NISQ, so noisy intermediate scale quantum circuits. And in fact, there is already a Python framework that is called CIRQ for creating, editing, and involving such uh, NISQ circuits. Uh, this CIRQ framework was developed by Google and also Google Research announced that uh, they are developing a framework to implement quantum neural network on near-term processors. And uh, they are interested in understanding what advantages may arise from generating massive superposition states during operation uh, of the network. Uh, all right, uh, quantum error correction. I've already also told that uh, this is one of the challenges, right? So we have, we have noise in our computations and how to reduce this noise, how to correct the errors. So in, 2090, in, in 1995, uh, uh, Shor followed his factoring algorithm with another uh, standard with a proof that quantum co error correcting codes exist. Uh, and uh, also it was proved a year later that these codes could theoretically push error rates of our quantum computations close to zero. And according to Professor Scott Aronson, who is one of the most famous uh, people working on quantum computing, this was the central discovery that convinced people that scalable quantum computing should be possible at all, and that it's merely a staggering problem of engineering. But at least from a theoretical point of view, we know how to do it, but uh, it's challenging from a practical point of view, uh, from a practical perspective. Uh, and this is just an example of a relatively simple quantum error correction uh, code. So uh, instead of or we can just uh, encode a single uh, qubit as or using three qubits in such a way that uh, the pure state zero correspond to the state zero 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 for these three qubits and similarly for the pure state one. And then when we assume that during performing our computations at most one qubit suffers a bit flip, then uh, after getting uh, an error, we can easily uh, correct or, or after after getting the results of measurements, we can easily um, uh, we can easily infer what's what's the correct uh, state, whether it's uh, zero or one. But this is just based on assumption that as most one qubit suffers a bit. Uh, I've also said that it's difficult to prove that quantum algorithms will be better than classical, and I've uh, mentioned that the Shor's algorithm is one of the examples. Uh, there is another uh, there's another example. Um, so there was there's something like a recommendation problem, which for which again uh, there was uh, or there is a quantum algorithm uh, working in polynomial operating in polynomial time already known, uh, but uh, uh, the same uh, professor uh, who just told about. Uh, the staggering problem of engineering. So Professor Scott Aronson uh, gave this problem to one of his uh, junior students uh, who had to had the goal to prove that uh, this problem cannot be uh, solved uh, as fast as on quantum computers. It cannot be solved on classical computers as fast as on quantum computers. But uh, it turned out that uh, this student uh, proved uh, something totally different. So he proved that uh, this problem can be solved on classical computers in polynomial time as well. Uh, and uh, it is just an example showing that uh, even if we don't manage to uh, just uh, achieve a significant quantum supremacy, we can expect that we may achieve some breakthrough in science, right? So. Um, because this uh, recommendation problem for many years, or maybe even for, for a few decades, was were considered to be difficult for classical computers. And But by uh, working on this problem and being inspired by the quantum algorithm, the student was able to develop a classical algorithm that uh, 
uh, works in polynomial time, which is quite an impressive uh, achievement. All right. Uh, I also started talking about different approaches for building quantum computers, right? So there are the ion traps, superconducting qubits, uh, there might be photon in quantum computers. Uh, there is this D waves machine, which so currently the, the largest D wave uh, machine uh, has more than 5,000 qubits. There is also idea to build topological quantum computers, uh, and it's investigated by Microsoft, mostly by Microsoft and the Delft University. But as far as I know, um, such quantum computer um, doesn't exist yet. Uh, so currently it's considered that these two approaches for building quantum computers, so ion traps and superconducting uh, qubits are the most promising, but uh, I will not be surprised if uh, it will uh, turn out that uh, we'll achieve um, even better results with uh, one of the other approaches as well in the future. So it's still an open question what we can do, and it's important to explore uh, different opportunities and different avenues. And coming back to the software side, uh, these are just some examples of uh, these quantum computing frameworks uh, that are already that are already developed and can be used for developing uh, some quantum software. So here is a panel lane, and I've mentioned that it was considered uh, a tensor flow of quantum computing, but uh, later Google released. TensorFlow Quantum, which is another library for, for quantum machine learning. Um, here we have Qiskit. So Qiskit is a uh, um, quantum programming framework uh, developed by IBM. Uh, it's also based on Python. Similarly, PyQL from Rigetti. Rigetti is another, uh, it's an interesting startup working not only on uh, software, but also quantum hardware. Uh, project Q, this is a project uh, developed at ETH Zurich. Uh, I also told you about the D-Wave's approach. So D-Wave uh, has a framework that's called LEAP for running this uh, quantum annealing experiments. Uh, Yao JL, so th it is an interesting example because this is a library for just uh, uh, developing software using uh, Julia and not Python. Uh, and Julia is very interesting programming language. And it's also considered by uh, some researchers that eventually it can be even better programming language for quantum computing than Python. Because currently most of the libraries and framework that I've mentioned uh, are based on Python. And here Yao JL is, is based on, on Julia. All right, so before we go to the next part, at the part about building quantum computing ecosystem, let's uh, check if we have some questions. Uh, there is just a question to provide <laughs> provide you with uh, PowerPoint with slides. Okay, I will try to share the slides later. Do we have any more questions? If there are some questions, then now we have some time to ask. So I'll wait for a few more seconds. If you have some questions, you can you can unmute yourself as well. And as I said, uh, uh, this uh, meeting is recorded, right? So there will be also video available. So you can also later watch and hear the lecture again. Okay, so let's let's go on. Um, now I would like to talk about- Hello, sir. Yes, yes, go on. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Sir, I had a doubt if it is solved. Sir, uh, I wanted to know that the two qubit gates like the control not gate, are they, can they be decomposed into smaller gates like the rotation gates? Um, let me go back to this slide. As far as I remember, uh, so as far as like I know, yes, 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 yes. Uh, let's go back to the synod gate. Uh, yes. Uh, what we can, what we know is that any quantum circuit can be simulated to an arbitrary degree of accuracy using a combination of synod gates and single qubit rotations. So it's sufficient to have C node gate and single qubit rotations, but uh, having only uh, single qubit rotations is not sufficient because C node is necessary to, uh, to have uh, entanglement, to entangle qubits, right? And- Yes, sir. 
Yeah, so okay. so that's why having only single qubit rotations is is not uh, sufficient. Okay, sir. thank Sorry. you. Okay, do we have any more questions? There's a question where yes. the recording is is available. Sir. Yes, yes, go on. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, I wanted to ask that: uh, uh, Do we need an uh, specially designed machinery or? Um, uh, basically hardware for the quantum computers or we can accommodate in the uh, already existing ones? Um, so, of course, we, we need uh, dedicated devices, right? So we need these quantum uh, processors and uh, there are several approaches to build quantum processors, right? Uh, there are approaches to do it based on ion traps, superconducting qubits, D-Waves machine, uh, it's quantum annealing approach. So there are there are at least several different approaches to do it, but we need to have a dedicated uh, quantum device. So uh, it is also possible to simulate quantum computers uh, on a classical computer, but uh, it's uh, you, you can easily see that when we have very large number of qubits. So as I said, on 32 qubits, or on n qubits, we should be able to represent two to the power of n uh, numbers, right? So you can easily see that for large number of qubits like 30 on 40, it might be even difficult to just represent all the numbers in memory of your computer, right? So that's why, um, so this might be also one of the uh, reasons of the, of the quantum advantage that Potentially, when we have, let's say, 100 qubits, then we'll be able to um, run computations uh, that will not be possible on classical computers. Uh, there is a question. The complexity increases when working with the group University of Gates. I'm not sure if I understand uh, correctly your question. Mm. So maybe you can try to clarify because uh, I'm not sure. So it, it depends how we, what do we uh, mean by complexity here, right? Because uh, currently, so in, in the NISQ area, when uh, the greatest source of noise are uh, our quantum gates, we want to minimize the amount of quantum gates in our quantum circuit. Right, so usually by complexity of our uh, algorithm, our quantum circuit, uh, we just mean the, the number of uh, quantum gates. But uh, again, uh, C naught gate uh, may introduce uh, more noise than uh, single qubit rotation. So um, also when we when we calculate the complexity uh, of our quantum system, then um, we should take it into account. Right, that we should also minimize the number of synod gates if, if possible. But I, I'm not sure if it answers your question, Pedro. I hope it's, it's, a, uh, it's a good answer for you. Okay, do we have any more questions? Because now we'll just go to the last part of this lecture which is building quantum computing ecosystem. So, okay, let's try. Uh, so first of all, why we should build a quantum computing ecosystem? So uh, there are some obstacles on the road toward quantum supremacy. So uh, first of all, uh, we need quantum competencies, right? So we need, we need education in quantum computing. This is also one of the reasons why we organize such uh, meetups like uh, Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. We need to develop quantum technology, right? So I also told you that contemporary quantum computers can already perform such computations, but we still cannot uh, do some experiments that will, be, that will give an advantage uh, comparing to classical computers. One of the reasons also is that the current classical computers are already very powerful and well, well developed because uh, we are developing classical computers for more than uh, 70 years, right? So it's quite a lot of time. And uh, in case of quantum computing, uh, this uh, domain is relatively young, right? So for, for sure there are still 
many things that we don't know <laughs> and uh, probably will uh, will find out and dis discover some very interesting things uh, in the coming years. So we need the research. We need real world applications. So we need business and we need funding um, just to fund education research, right? So that's why we need the whole ecosystem. And finally, in order to have it all, we need people. So in every organization and in every ecosystem, people are the most important. And this, this is just a foundation, right? For, for everything. Uh, but uh, now I hope that you know and you understand why we do it, why we organize uh, such meetups, and also why we organize some other initiatives. So what do we organize? So at the beginning, I told you that I'm also a board member of uh, QWORD. So QWORD is a global network of individuals, groups, and communities collaborating on education and implementation of quantum technologies and research activities. Uh, and uh, um, everything started in 2019 thanks to the project that was called QDrive. So it was organized by researchers from University of Latvia, from Riga. Uh, <laughs> there's one person from QTurkey. So yeah, hello, welcome. And uh, good to have you with us. Uh, so uh, in fact, QTurkey together with QPoland was one of the uh, founding countries, right? So there were five countries uh, or five local groups uh, which decided to organize QWORT, right? So the researchers from University of, uh, of Riga, from Latvia, uh, visited several universities in several countries in Europe. Uh, they um, prepared uh, special educational materials and uh, we organized workshops on introduction to quantum computing based on these educational materials. And we also discussed how we can collaborate and uh, for us, it was obvious that it might be very important and uh, very useful, helpful uh, to just collaborate internationally because at least here in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, we don't, uh, we are not, uh, or our innovation ecosystem is not uh, as developed as let's say in the United States or uh, in China, in the United Kingdom or in Western Europe. So if we want to be competitive and uh, we need to collaborate, so it will be much easier for us. Uh, so this was one of the reasons why we decided to organize uh, and establish something like, like QWORD. So currently, QWORD has uh, almost 20 member states, and uh, we also have a formal uh, association that is called QWORD Association that is uh, um, registered in Estonia. So I've mentioned that everything started from uh, the workshop on introduction to quantum programming. So this workshop is based on materials, training materials that are called the bronze. So these are relatively simple, ba basic uh, training materials. So this is just an introduction to quantum computing. We have already developed more advanced materials that are called silver, and there are even more advanced materials called gold uh, under development, right? So, so far we uh, organized uh, almost 70 workshops. Uh, currently we have the workshop number 68 uh, ongoing in, in Spain. And soon, soon Spain will, will join us. Uh, we also organize hackathons. So this is just a website uh, of a hackathon organized by QTurkey. So greetings to people from QTurkey. I know there's at least one more person uh, from, from Turkey with us, so welcome. Uh, we also uh, have our public repository for developing and sharing our educational projects, code, and similar materials. It's, it's open to individuals and groups, and we also want to make it open. We want to develop free and open access educational materials. So basically, we want to democratize uh, this quantum computing domain so that uh, everyone will have uh, more or less equal access to the quantum computing technology or, or at least the knowledge about quantum computing. So this is also one of the goals of, uh, of the keyword. We also promote equality, uh, equality, diversity and inclusion. So that's why there is a dedicated uh, project called Q Women. So our women from, from the member countries also organize uh, workshops or events to educate uh, 
uh, girls uh, interested in uh, quantum computing technologies. We also organize dedicated workshops for uh, juniors and for high school students, uh, because the, the general training materials that we have uh, might be a bit too difficult for high school students. So we also try to adjust them to uh, make them more accessible for, uh, for young people. Uh, Q University. So uh, recently we've released our first uh, open on ma massive open online course on quantum computing. And uh, eventually we would like to uh, have uh, the whole study programs and also training a professor, or training professional uh, lecturers at different universities. Uh, so maybe in, let's say, five, 10 years from now, uh, we'll have this special um, quantum computing studies, uh, after which students uh, could receive a bachelor or master degrees, right, in quantum computing, let's say. So this, this is just an idea. We'll see how it will develop, but uh, this, this is uh, one of the directions of developing these educational materials as well. It's currently an initialization phase. Uh, we also train new mentors because in order to um, organize such workshops and lectures, uh, we need people, we need uh, competent people. So that's why we also organize training for, for mentors. We have such trainings more or less once per year. Currently, during the pandemic uh, situation, of course, uh, these trainings are online only. Beside the education, we also have a research department that is called Q-Research. And within this Q-Research department, we also organize some interesting initiatives like Q-Intern. So uh, Q-Intern or the goal is of the Q-Intern program is to match senior researchers like professors with, uh, with young um, researchers, PhD students, students interested in doing research in quantum computing while being supervised by senior uh, scientists, experienced scientists. Uh, so the idea is that first, these experienced scientists uh, propose, uh, uh, propose uh, uh, some research topics uh, for students, and uh, then uh, students can apply to work during the summer, during let's say usually about eight weeks in July and August to work on a selected project and being supervised by the senior researcher. And uh, this year we had the uh, second edition of the Q-Intern uh, program. Uh, and uh, yes, <laughs> uh, oh, we have uh, one of my interns because I was also one of the supervisors this year in the Q-Intern program. Uh, and uh, it, it turned out to be a very successful initiative. So for sure, we'll be organizing similar uh, events in the future. Uh, the next one will be most likely next year. But in the Q-Research department, we also have study groups. So uh, people interested in uh, similar research areas can also meet once per, let's say, a few weeks and uh, study some research papers on quantum computing. Uh, I've said that currently we have already 18 Q cousins, but we are working on entangling even more. Um, so at, by the end of this year, we'll have already more than 20, uh, uh, 20 Q cousins. And if you are interested in QWORT, we invite you to join, to follow our website, to, uh, our Facebook and Twitter profiles, uh, to join our community Discord. We also have an internal mailing list. Uh, and uh, depending on in which country you are, there are also local groups. So for example, in Poland, we have this Q Poland group. So um, you can also see a list of uh, current members of Q Poland. And if you are interested, also feel free to contact us, follow our Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn profiles, join our community stack. Uh, and when we organize some um, events like uh, Warsaw Quantum Computing Group meetups or uh, bronze workshops. Formally, we do it uh, by Quantum, or it's done by Quantum AI Foundation, which is uh, a charity organization aiming to support uh, development, 
and collaboration in science and new technologies, especially artificial intelligence and quantum computing, but also other fields of mathematics and computer science. Uh, so we organize uh, Warsaw Quantum Computing Group meetups, uh, Poland workshops, hackathons, contests. Uh, I'm a founder and uh, chairperson of this foundation. Uh, and uh, Warsaw Quantum Computing Group meetup is uh, our first uh, initiative, right? So it's a meetup for quantum computing enthusiasts in Warsaw, but currently since we organize uh, uh, these meetups online, then of course it's it's open to for people from from uh, all over the world, and the goal is to facilitate education and research collaboration of people interested in quantum computing, building quantum computing awareness and community of quantum computing specialists. So each meeting consists of a lecture given by a quantum computing specialist, and some of the lectures are followed uh, by an after party when quantum computing enthusiasts can interact and exchange their ideas. So it was before the pandemic, of course. Uh, initially, the meetings were organized in several locations in Poland, but from the beginning of the pandemic crisis, uh, these meetings are remote only. We record our lectures and then make them available on our YouTube channel, and hopefully this lecture will be also available there, so you can easily find uh, our channel on YouTube and, and follow it. We started in uh, 2018, to, in November 2018, to commemorate 100th anniversary for gaining independence by Poland. Uh, and the, the lecture, Introduction to Quantum Computing, was then given by Professor Rafał Demkowicz Bobrzański from Faculty of Physics from the University of Warsaw. And uh, we have meetings more or less once per month uh, during the academic year, so from uh, October to June or July. Uh, if you are interested in our meetings, meetups, uh, follow our profiles. You can join our mailing list. Um, follow our website, YouTube channel. So you are invited, of course. Uh, we also, this year, we started organizing uh, meetings together with a similar quantum computing group from Washington. Uh, so we call it uh, uh, WQC times two, because uh, we have two groups from Washington and Warsaw. But later, several other groups joined. So for example, from Alexandria, uh, from Toronto, so uh, it is possible that we'll also modify the formula of, uh, of these meetups uh, in the future as well. Uh, besides the meetups, we also organize hackathons. So yesterday, uh, there was a final of uh, the Quantum Games Hackathon that we organized. We also organized a contest popularizing quantum computing, and this year in Poland, we organized the Quantum Challenge in collaboration with uh, IBM and the uh, bank uh, BNP. Um, all right, so if you are interested in quantum computing, if you have some business uh, ideas or uh, looking for funds, especially for your open source projects, there is an interesting initiative that is called Unitary Fund. You can apply for a micro grant to develop uh, an open source uh, project in quantum computing. There are already uh, some companies working on quantum computing in Poland and, and abroad. And the largest players are IBM, Google, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, D-Wave, Xanadu, Zapata Computing, we get the INQ. Bay Technology is probably the largest, or maybe the, the most uh, important player here in, in, in Poland. It's a company based in Krakow. Board Technology is one of the first uh, companies, probably for the second company in, in Poland working on quantum computing, I think that currently it uh, doesn't exist anymore, but it was one of the first as well. Uh, but some, some other companies also uh, emerged in, in Poland and were recently established. So where to learn more? Uh, I've already gave you some links to QWORD and QPoland uh, resources. So as you know, we have profiles on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, YouTube. So you are just welcome. and encouraged you to follow. Uh, we organize webinars. We have uh, courses on machine learning. You can watch videos uh, on YouTube, like lectures of Peter Vitek. Uh, you can join some uh, groups. Uh, so uh, there are groups like Quantum Computing Now, Quantum AI, Quantum Information, Quantum Computer Science of the World Unite. So this, this one is probably the largest group on Facebook. 
Um, there, there are also some interesting newsletters like quantum computing report. Uh, there are many online tutorials on Qiskit, PyQL, Pendelain available on the web. Uh, another newsletter is Swiss Quantum Hub, very interesting as well. So currently it's quite easy to stay up to date with the news. If you want to learn even more, uh, there's also an educational uh, initiative that's called Cureka. They organize uh, also some workshops on, on quantum computing. So it's, I think it's similar initiative to uh, Cureka, but uh, this initiative is, is commercial. In Poland, we also have some uh, seminars. For example, there is a seminar called Kraków Quantum Informatics Seminar. And um, in Warsaw, we also have seminars organized by the Center for Theoretical Physics. There's the Quantum Computing Group. Um, there are also seminars at the Faculty of Physics of the University of Warsaw. And I believe that there are similar seminars on other universities. Thank you for your attention. Uh, it looks that we still have some time for questions. So if there are some questions to the last part, about the quantum computing ecosystem or to the previous parts, and I'll be happy to answer. I don't see more questions now, which is thanks. Thank you. Uh, so maybe just to, just to let you know, uh, the next uh, Warsaw Quantum Computing Meetup will be probably organized at the end of October or beginning of November. Uh, it's not confirmed yet, but if you decide to follow our channels, then you'll stay uh, up to date and we'll let you know. Uh, one person would like to ask a question uh, in Polish. Uh, Friedrich, it's, it's fine. You can just ask a Dziękuję bardzo. Chciałem się spytać o taką rzecz. Jako student Wydziału Matematyki, Informatyki i Mechaniki w tym roku obrót skończenia pierwszego roku matematyki zaczynam informatykę. Czy są jakieś przedmioty na wydziale, które konkretnie mógłbym wziąć na, polecał Pan, żebym wziął na przyszłych latach, jakbym chciał się interesować właśnie quantum computingiem? Z tego, co Kojarzę, chyba nie ma jeszcze takich przedmiotów na uniwersytecie. Wiem, że chyba był jakiś jeden przedmiot. Mogę sprawdzić, poszukać i potem podesłać może panu informację. Mógł być przedmiot, gdzie były jakieś elementy informatyki kwantowej, ale to nie był, nie był taki przedmiot, gdzie wyraźnie była informatyka kwantowa. Także jeśli chodzi tutaj o rekomendację, tutaj taką edukację, to na ten moment no mamy te nasze warsztaty, które organizujemy jako, jako Q Poland i Przede wszystkim tutaj raczej bym te nasze źródła polecał. Uh, I will translate it to English. There was a question uh, from a student uh, on the University of Warsaw if there are already some uh, courses at the University of Warsaw on, on quantum computing uh, that they recommend. And uh, I told that uh, uh, there is one, uh, one class, at least one course, in which there are some elements of quantum computing. I will check it and send uh, information later. Uh, but uh, there are, as far as I know, there are probably not uh, such dedicated courses yet, and uh, uh, I rather um, recommend attending uh, the workshops that we that we organize as a uh, Quantum AI Foundation. Uh, but it is possible that uh, there will be such uh, uh, such such classes as well. So. I can I can say that I heard that there are such plans for the future. I'm not sure if it will happen even this year, but I can tell that uh, there are some such uh, uh, such initial plans at least. Okay, uh, are there any more questions? Actually, Pavel, I have if you have time. So. Okay. So first of all, as I am a bachelor's degree in engineering. So in this field, most of the cases I have searched about uh, the master programs and the most uh, upper in, um, educational programs, like PhD, for example. In my field, most of the master programs actually uh, in, in their admission requirements, they say you need to take the basic quantum mechanics. These kind of lectures from your school or you know the courses, or you have to provide you have an qualification for you within all these quantum mechanics. But in my case, I do not have these lectures. 
but you know there's a lot of options to learn these quantum mechanics or kind of stuff in the lectures basically in the youtube or you know the internet there's yes. so how can i actually you know fulfill these requirements without getting kind of you know extra uh, graduation lectures from any kind of school do you any kind of op op options to give me a kind of you know maybe the online courses you yes, know, the yes. Edits, maybe yeah. for some kind of platform mm -hmm. would be so, enough to fulfill these requirements yeah so you know for for this i would recommend this introductory workshop that is called bronze you can check the website um, or the sub page on the keywords website so these are uh, so there is a GitLab repository uh, with uh, training materials prepared using Qiskit library. So this library developed by IBM. And also uh, you will find that there are some, uh, let's say preliminary requirements to just start uh, doing this, this course. Uh, so there are some, some notebooks with uh, the basics of mathematics and Python, for example. Uh, and, uh, but the, the quantum, so in fact, in quantum computing, uh, you really don't need uh, to understand quantum mechanics that much in order to just write some quantum code. And we, that can be later executed on quantum uh, processors, quantum devices. So of course it, it's good to, to know, but uh, the necessary basics uh, are, uh, so not, not that, uh, uh, let's say advanced, I would say, right? So uh, you can you can easily. So the, the more much more important is uh, software engineering, and so just background in quantum uh, or in computer science in general, and uh, understanding of some also basic mathematics like linear algebra and probability. Uh, so I would say that these are these are the necessary basics, and uh, you really don't need to understand. Uh, quantum mechanics fully. So here in this slide, in this lecture, I tried to uh, give you um, some information uh, about quantum mechanics as well, just uh, to let you understand everything better. But in fact, uh, as far as I know, you don't need to understand uh, this, the quantum mechanics in order to just write uh, quantum code, so quantum programs. Uh, you don't need to fully understand quantum mechanics, let's say. So the, the necessary basics are really uh, simple, I would say. But if you if you are looking for uh, the requirements regarding mathematics and uh, and for example Python, then you can find them in this uh, GitLab repository. And, and also, uh, I rec really recommend uh, all the other resources. So, so uh, even on the website of uh, of our uh, quantum quantum AI foundation, uh, we also have a website with resources. Uh, I can see that I uh, didn't give the link here, but when you go to the website of the quantum AI foundation, um, let me just check it. Yes, uh, qaif.org, you will find uh, something like resources, and there are also many. Uh, useful links uh, to some educational materials. Thank you, Pavel. And the, I have an, another question. So, do you think there's a kind of you know requirements for the you know having a, a master or the a PhD degree in, in working for this place? If the bachelor degree is enough to work in this field, right? Yes. You so don't have to yes. Go from, mm -hmm. the, more 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 advanced level than this so, yes in general i would say that no degree is necessary so everything depends on uh, your your skills and and your knowledge but as i said we also organize some workshops for uh, even high school students so for for people who even haven't started uh, studies yet right so this basic math and uh, basic programming skills that are necessary are really not that difficult. So if you want to understand everything in details, then the theory is difficult and it may require studies. But if you are interested only in, let's say, applying uh, 
and writing some uh, quantum computing algorithms, then in my opinion, you even don't need any studies. Right, so, so the, 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 math, uh, the math and the computer science background is uh, that is necessary to learn uh, new things or the things that are required are really relatively simple and it should be achievable by uh, best high school students. Maybe not all high school students, but at least the, for the best high school students. Yeah, thank you. I understand the situation. I got all answers to my four questions. So thank you. Thank okay, you for good. the presentation for today. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Sir? Yes, yes. Sir, this last link, how can we access this? Can you please put this in chat box, the quantum challenge one? Uh, the quantum challenge, the link or? The link, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, let me just check if I can do it now. Uh, let me maybe just uh, can I copy it. Uh, maybe like this. Okay, so this is a link. But I think that this website was in Polish, right? Because it was the challenge was organized in Poland. But uh, there was also another uh, another meetup, uh, so sorry, another quantum challenge organized worldwide by IBM. So this challenge was organized this year by Quantum AF or by us by Poland by uh, Bank BNP and uh, IBM, uh, and it was for people from Poland. But uh, you should know that there are also similar quantum challenges organized worldwide by IBM. Yes, right. sir. sir, IBM once we participate, I thought this is something new, so. Okay. All right, is there anything else? There's a question about providing uh, slides. I will try to do it as well and send you a link. Uh, I will have one question to, to you because uh, I was also asked to get a feedback from participants. So uh, I will prefer a Google form and send it to you by email. So I will, I can be ask you to fill in the form that later I will send uh, by email and also give a feedback. Uh, how did you like uh, this lecture? Uh, what did you learn comparing to what uh, you know before this lecture, whether it was useful and, and so on. So this is, this is just uh, my request. So if you, like this lecture, then I would kindly I kindly ask you to fill in the form and uh, and and share your uh, your experience, your impression. So that may be very helpful for us, uh, for some let's say formal reasons. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that's that's all. So uh, I will send you. I have email addresses of all registered people, so I will later send um, a video recording, uh, and uh, I will also try to share my slides so that um, you will be able to just uh, access all the links here, follow our Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube profiles. All right, thank you. Thanks, Fazli. So if there are no more questions, I will stop recording now and stop sharing as well.